Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Rexford Katnaw, who's the president of Keach Group, and we'll be talking about business succession planning. Rexford, welcome to the program. Mike, I appreciate the invitation to be on the show. Hey, you're welcome. And I always love hearing about secession planning because I feel like it is so vital, but so few business owners spend enough time doing it well ahead of their exit. And so this is so timely just to kind of get some of these techniques out there that you advise your clients on. But before we dive into that, give us a little bit of your story and your entrepreneurial journey and what got you into the uh, financial services industry. Well, it, it's been a journey. That's an apt term. Uh, I spent my mm-hmm. early career at Deloitte Consulting, which is was then one of the big six audit techs and consulting firms, now known as Deloitte. And while there, I developed specialties in, in acquisitions and became a, a national practice leader in compensation planning, which I did largely for physician group practices and, and executives in those health systems. It, at times, I think there's some well-placed criticism of consultants, the most common being that they've not run things, but yeah. we did. We, we, implemented, we implemented plans that we helped create, and uh, they all became in force successful plans, and so we were proud of them. Uh, management consulting is a good foundation for financial services. I think they both require us to be partners for change without having formal or positional authority. And so you really do learn the business of change management. Uh, And our client success always in in wealth management or in consulting came partly from from analytical rigor, for sure. But it was also found in relationships and trust. We we were always Mm -hmm. more successful after engagement time had passed and we developed relationships or trust with those people. Where a family business is involved, often with the owner who started the company, uh, you really have a charged third rail. I have a lasting memory of this, visiting a a physician client some years back on the way to visit his business. It was the evening before the scheduled closing of the sale of his company that he started. And he wanted to see it and have me and two. This was in a northern location on a bitterly cold winter evening, which we have in in Minnesota. And he had an equity partner who was dragging his feet at a late stage when terms had been agreed to. And that's pretty common. Yeah. And it was creating a lot of stress. And my client, who had become a friend, had his car parked outside despite the oversized garage and his home directly in front. And I asked him, why is your car parked outside on a bitterly cold night? And he grinned that sly smile that, he, that only he could, uh, that he could show and told me years earlier, he had an urgent patient matter that required him to rush to surgery. And he drove through his garage door. Oh, no. <laughs> ever, since that, ever since that time, he parked his car outdoors. But he related <laughs> that story to illustrate his motivation for building his business could provide medical care his way. And I would say if there's a common thread that connects entrepreneurs that I work with, it's that they have a a reason that's usually partly independence, that they don't want a boss, but they also have uh, a business goal or path or or course that they want to chart, and they start their company to do that. Yeah. When I started our when I, when I started our firm about uh, oh more than twenty years ago now we advised only business clients that's how we got our start and I spent a lot of time with CPAs and attorneys and most of our clients also had a financial advisor <clears throat> excuse me <clears throat> and what I observed was these professionals were living on separate islands. That the yeah. CPA was preparing their tax return and was attentive and knowledgeable about bonus depreciation or tax deductions or pass-through business entities. 
but was unaware of what investments were owned or the size of the location of the investments or the tax consequences of these. Or, and certainly the business risks, probably risk management being one of the, one of the major shortcomings that we would, we would run across. Most of these clients did not have a business valuation until we completed one, which is, was surprising to me. A $8 million business, two business partners and no business valuation is common, mm. much more common than we might imagine. Most did not even have a will. I have a current client um, who owns a multi-million dollar business with a spouse. They have three children and had no will or trust until we started working with them, and they now have these. So I was having deep personal conversations with these owners, uh, successful people, yet the conversations were often too late in the business life cycle for us to make a difference. So we expanded into our private client practice. Um, beyond business ownerships to provide, you know, a little more retirement and asset protection planning and a longer runway, more time to have an impact. And that's how you I know, got it, into the business. Yeah, I mean, that's just awesome, uh, that journey. And the example about the doctor in the garage door reminded me of something. Uh, he recognized that there was, a, you know, like a hiccup in his process because he had a mistake once. So what did he do? He didn't keep making that same mistake. He made a workaround and he set himself up for success so that he doesn't have to worry about that. And I think that that just ties so nicely into when we think about succession planning, because you never know what those hiccups are going to be. And if you've not exited a comp- uh, 10 companies recently, then you're not even going to know. So having someone like yourself to look from the outside in, and give guidance is just so huge. And I know that exit planning or or succession planning ties into retirement planning because the owner then needs to be able to say, oh, with the you know successful um, exit of the company, I now will have X number of dollars. They seem to be very different, but I'm sure that there's similarities. Talk a little bit about where exit planning and retirement planning are similar, and then also where some of those differences lie. Sure. Well, uh, I'll, I'll preface the, the answer to saying no one person has expertise in, in all areas of wealth management. It really yeah. it does take a talented team. And uh, full disclosure, I did not get that team right on my first try. Um, we, we, we do now. We have a, we have a terrific team, uh, and that team allows us to, to think across disciplines, whether it's investment portfolios or valuation, which was an expertise of mine, or tax or asset protection planning, and, and uh, especially state planning, which we've uh, developed a, a national partnership for. Uh, there are similarities and difference. To be sure, business exit planning has some extra boxes to check in our process. It has a valuation step, uh, a very necessary and high impact uh, step. It has an, it requires an exit strategy. The earlier you start that process, the more valuable or more flexible that strategy is. Mm-hmm. It has a legal transfer, you know, complete with documentation and due diligence and the legal paperwork. And one part or box to check that people don't often think about, which is really an operating transition. I, I'm I'm transitioning out of the business. The owners typically had a key role or multiple key roles, and there needs to be a transition to make that work smoothly. Uh, we had we a good succession or a good transaction for a business requires or demands that the business be successful after the close. And that's often not not the case in in business exits that are not planned especially. Uh, but of, of all of our services to p- private clients, they're essential for business succession or they're successful, excuse me, they're essential for business owners or they should be. If we, if, if you were in my office and I was drawing a picture of our planning process, we would draw or have published a large rectangle 
and we divide that into <clears throat> excuse me four boxes with a horizontal and a vertical line. So now you're looking at a rectangle with four boxes. And in the upper left, I would label that box growth. And the upper right box, I'd label income. Lower left, asset protection. And the lower right, legacy. You know, that's the estate planning piece. Mm-hmm. And if you think of the two boxes on the left side as the value of your assets, and on the right side as the destination or the flow of money, you can really find ways to solve a financial puzzle that are very, very effective and administratively not complicated. Um, There are many ways to do that, but there's typically only one best answer for our client. And so it, it, it is about goal setting, but not goal setting, asking just, uh, you know, where would you like to travel when you retire? It's much, much deeper than that with questions. So, so the process breaks yeah. financial decision making into chewable, logical pieces. I, I think there's a misconception, or at least I, I don't agree with the, uh, with the mindset that you need a financial plan that is all tied together in one document at one point in time. A business, business succession can be too complicated for that, too, too much to take on. Mm-hmm. And so each box in our process, you know, it uses data for the client uh, to make decisions and stay connected to the plan. But it's, it, it, it does relate to one of the boxes. The the box for for income and for estate planning, those asset uh, flows or cash flows on the right side of the box, you know, are really driven from tax reports that we generate um, every year for every client. These are tax reports that, by way of example, that actually feed the each box of a Form 1040 tax return into a tax opportunities list. And we share that with, uh, with not only the client every year, but the client's CPA with their approval. So in, in my opinion, the principle that ties all of that together and makes it most valuable is flexibility. It's one of the most important and, and underutilized filters in financial planning and the one perhaps we're, we're most proud to optimize. Flexibility is, is the ability to change priorities or your decisions without an undue burden or an mm-hmm. undue cost. So a, well, a well-designed plan has a lot of flexibility. Uh, for example, you know, most businesses are, are low asset or, 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 excuse me, low basis assets or zero basis assets that trigger taxes when they sell. Uh, so our 401k and IRA, traditional IRA savings accounts, trigger taxes when they're distributed, which they must be under required minimum distributions. And so when a, a business sale, going back to the first example, it, it, it triggers an ordinary income tax. Typically, even if most of it is a capital gain, it will trigger ordinary income taxes in almost any deal structure. And it triggers capital gains taxes, which stack on top of ordinary income. So if the business is valuable, it, it could trigger significant estate taxes at the, at the federal level and in many states. So we're, there are many exit planning advisors that are familiar with this space, and they include using trusts, advanced insurance strategies, hybrid insurance strategies, certainly charitable giving strategies are powerful. And so is gifting, among others. And Mm -hmm. there are similar questions that affect business succession. There are many ways to sell a business, and all of them have tax consequences, and all of them flow or the flow of money or income for retirement on the right side of the boxes. In in my experience... Several yeah. times you've mentioned process and check the box yeah. and it makes me think that there is a process that, boy, if Rexford has not put that together so that he can guide his clients through there, certainly the business owner hasn't thought of or come up with that process. So um, it makes me think, what size of a company is there where the process isn't as uh, long 
or or does size of a company determine uh, how long it takes for the exit planning or the success of the exit planning? Is a smaller company easier to perform the process or is the, is it the same for small and large? It just takes a little bit longer. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Size and organization matter for sure. I think mm-hmm. for smaller companies, which I will define as maybe $5 million in revenue or below, all of the private client planning matters. Yeah. I mean, th- those are companies where the, the owner's income could be 300000 or $400,000 per year, sometimes less, sometimes more. And the private client planning matters a lot. But for companies that are, you know, larger or 10 million or more, um, we, we, we see a list of filters such as uh, legal entity and industry such as business to business services or software, revenue size and type of buyer being the ones that you read about where, where the online content is, is ripe with advice that matter. Uh, but they really matter less than the factors that drive company value in the eyes yeah. of buyers. So the, the company is only as va- valuable as, as the buyer community thinks it is and is attracted to it. And, and these are recurring revenue streams. If, if a financial advisor has assets under management and those are billed annually, that's an annual revenue stream. Uh, software service businesses, which uh, are near and dear to my heart, not because I, I own one, but because I pay for about a dozen of those monthly subscriptions for software <laughs> uh, services. And those are the companies that are attracting great demand. And they will, in, they will have higher valuations and more interested and committed buyers and more competitive buyers. Uh, I, yeah, I've that, witnessed that, the, the. Go ahead. You have a question. I was just going to say that software as a service model is is so so uh, huge these days. Yeah, yeah. I and I've witnessed that you know the the risks of value drivers. Once an owner who was one of my most respected guys and and probably best personal connections, he came to me. Uh, exploring ways to sell his business. And he had a, an $8 million business that unfortunately had about 80% of its revenue from one customer. Wow. Who had just canceled their service agreement nearly overnight. Mm. Classy guy. I liked him dearly. And within six months, he lost his business. He lost his retirement plan and sold his beautiful home. And so, so that's sort of the extreme end of not doing planning well and dealing with, uh, you know, asset protection strategies uh, for a business that, you know, was a pretty substantial one. 100%. It, it, it just gets back to that aspect of planning, planning ahead well ahead of the time you need it and having a plan and having someone to guide you through it. So why do you think that a lot of business owners don't have a succession plan? Do they just assume that, you know, about the time I want to retire, I'll just put a for sale sign on the business and I'm sure someone will pay me a bunch of money. Why don't they have a plan? And, you know, maybe they and then also kind of related to that, do they assume that they've got a comprehensive plan just because they have a basic buy sell agreement? Well, Mike, I, I think that'll be the easiest question you ask me. Uh, <laughs> I, I've lived this question for decades, and in fact, some years back, I wrote an article on that question. Um, we don't do succession planning for some of the same reasons that we don't have wills or trusts. Uh, the reason we, the reasons we give to people outwardly are, you know, lack of time, lack of money, the tactical demands of the business. Um, you and I are business owners, and there's always more on the plate to do than we get done. Um, there is a lack of successors, which I think, uh, is a shortcoming on all of us as owners of a business to not be developing people. Uh, and that is part of our process, by the way, where we've spent a lot of thinking time, uh, on the issue of developing successors. 
and I think as much overlooked as the apparent absence of, of a process that proves a return on investment. Business owners are, are ROI-driven people, return on investment. They're very good at that, bottom-line people and thinkers. And what we don't acknowledge um, is that we have to be able to demonstrate that that process yields a set of results or outcomes that are worth the time and money we put into them. It, mm-hmm. it, there's a personal human side to this that succession planning requires really difficult conversations and self-assessment about the state of the business, about our current employees, our financial readiness, aging, mortality, uh, you know, one spouse dying before another or a partner separation, which had become uh, in our early years uh, really a specialty of ours, uh, partner buyouts. I have felt all of these in my own firm, you know, in terms of, of readiness of current employees to step up or where are their ceilings. And uh, many of us, me including, included at times, we have not run our business with the end in mind, even if we care about who runs it when we're gone. 100%. You know, I think that um, too many times people just think, yeah, 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 I, I did that. I did that Google search and I, I found a succession plan 101 guide and I did it. But did you do it right? Was it comprehensive? And I think that... If it, a lot of people may be listening to this, might think I might not have a comprehensive exit plan. So, what advice would you give them? And then, how can people learn more and reach out and connect with you? Well, first, an observation, and it's it's unconventional. I think when it comes to succession or sale of a business, transparency really has advantages. When you think about how most businesses sell; they're owner driven. Um, when the time comes that they sell, they do it quietly. They they obtain a, a business broker to list their business. It is done um, it is done privately, and the employees are not aware or engaged in that process until one or more of those key people has to be. The example being, you know, the controller who has to help you know, pull together documentation or, or financial information for due diligence. The, the, the owners who are very open with their employees and their loyalty to their employees have an advantage. If, if, if the, the mentality is the business is always for sale and, and conversations are open that someone has approached us and, you know, we'll see where that goes. Um, there, there's a lot of, power in that with the employee group potentially. It has risks. Uh, it's, it's, it's not a black and white observation, but, but it's an observation. Um, the, the second or more concrete, maybe the first, if you, if you count concrete uh, steps to take is make a plan. Yeah. Whether it's on a, a pad of paper or you start consulting uh, mentors, um, you know, make a plan. It should be written. There are lots of sources for that. There are uh, there are people to consult. There are CEO um, enter groups like Vistage. There are advisory boards that can be very effective if they're good boards. Um, the starting point for us is that we advocate using a succession readiness assessment. It is a checklist that we created, and it is a it, it consists of two steps, and the first is a, a no-cost, no-loss first step. It's simply an assessment of succession. It asks some questions, some of which would be expected ones, and some of the questions on there would not be expected by most people that would take that assessment. Um, that That's uh, advice from us. For families that are closer to an exit, and by that I would define it as five years or less, uh, don't don't go solo. You get yeah. one shot at this. And uh, again, get a mentor, might be another business owner, an executive coach, a CEO mentor, uh, an advisory board, or a financial advisor that, that works in this space. You, you need to connect the boxes between 
uh, the tax work uh, that CPAs are doing and the financial records of the business and tax planning and estate planning and retirement planning, which is really all about income and um, and legacy, how you pass all those assets that you don't use for, for retirement on. And <laughs> lastly, this popped into my mind when I looked at the calendar, recognized it was it was uh, the time for our call is um, read the annual reports for Amazon. You've hmm. never read an Amazon annual report. Um, I, I don't like all of the large big tech and, and internet companies, but uh, Jeff Bezos, regardless of what you feel about him or Amazon, if you read the first, second, third annual report and you continue reading those, you'll learn more about visionaries and um, getting into new markets yeah. and, and combining things to add value, even where customers weren't looking for a solution. Uh, it's fascinating. Excellent. I, Excellent I have, advice. Well, Rex, uh, if have, someone is interested in reaching out and connecting with you, what's the best way that they can do that? Well, they can um, they can uh, email me at any time. Uh, my email is my first initial last name, so it's R C A T T A N A C H at Keats Group K E A T S Group dot com. Or go to our website and look up our contact information and we have some publications uh, you might choose to read as well. Excellent. Well, Rexford, thank you so much for coming on today. It was a real pleasure talking with you. Thanks. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.